thank you very much for coming. It's an encouragement. Um, I am praying and we are all praying that the Lord in his mercy will challenge our hearts, speak to us, you know, um, encourage us in this ministry he has called yourself and myself into. Now, just to say very quickly that it's actually a Bible teacher's retreat. So when I say, when we mention preachers, it doesn't mean that it's only for those who stand on the pulpit to preach. So if you exhort, if you encourage in the body of Christ, this is for you as well. It's not only somebody who stands in front and preach. There are preachers we have who do not have a pulpit, <laughs> an official pulpit, but their places of work have become their sphere of ministry and they're able to share the word of God and you know, encourage lives in that capacity. So it's not, we're not just talking about people who preach. You know, those who lead home groups, those who share the word of God with youth, with the youth, they don't have an official lectern like this. So I just want to encourage us to know that God has called all of us into this ministry of encouraging people from his word and sharing with them. And so it's something we need to refresh our lives about. Um, the program, I don't know if you had access to it. Thank you. The program is, thank you, just give me one. Do you have a few? No, oh, one. just one. Okay. The program is very deliberate. If you look at it, you notice that after every, every, after every talk, there is a session for prayer. We don't just want to sh um, talk and we are not responding to God. So it's very deliberate that we have um, highlighted the, the matter for prayer. So just to let you know, so that we would all be in the attitude of prayer and we are trusting that the Lord will encourage us and challenge our hearts this morning. So I'll open up in prayer and I'll just, I will just share very briefly the burden for this meeting and then we'll start off. So let's pray. Everlasting Father, we want to thank you again. Thank you for your love and faithfulness towards us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for, your, for how you've been with us. Thank you, Lord, that you have made us, given us this opportunity to come like this and fellowship with you, first of all, and with ourselves in this capacity as those who share the word of God, those who teach the word of God, those who preach the word of God. Lord, we thank you. We don't want to take this opportunity for granted because, Lord, some people are looking for this kind of opportunity, but they don't have it. And so, Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Thank you. And we want to just pray again that you come and meet us, Lord. Come and speak to us. Encourage our hearts, Lord Jesus. Even in the generation which we are living in, we pray, Lord, that you will light, ignite the fire again in our hearts so that we can um, discharge this ministry you have placed into our hands effectively. Lord, it is your divine approval we are looking for, for each and every one of us. We want you to stamp your approval upon our lives so that we can be effective in what you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord. As we look at the Lord Jesus again, May the light from his life beam onto our hearts, Lord, so that we can be a reflection of his glory. Thank you. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. So before we take an opening, our opening song, I will just want to share very quickly why we have, or should I share the burden for this meeting? Um, if you open your Bibles to 
Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> I, I want to, before I share that, I want to say that our, we have a brother from Northern Ireland, um, Paul Johnston. He will also be sharing with us. He's a pastor over in Northern Ireland in Fintona. I think I'm pronouncing it properly. I used to call it Fintona, but it's Fintona, you know, with the Irish twang, or another Irish accent. But I will allow Paul to introduce himself um, um, later um, so that we can get on. He said, dear brother to me, he has shared with us here before. And uh, okay. Okay, hello, Paul. Hello, everyone in Martok. Akin, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Good morning. Oh, that's good. God bless you. So yeah, it's lo lovely to be joining with you again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we pray that the Lord will bless you as you share with us as well. Amen. Amen. Um, so I just want to share the, the scripture that has been the burden for this meeting. So in Matthew chapter 7, don't worry, I'm not going to preach on the whole chapter. So put your mind at ease. <laughs> Matthew 7. This was at the end of Jesus Christ's teaching on the mount. The, the, when he was teaching on the Beatitudes and that long expanded sermon, which started in Matthew chapter 5, isn't it? Matthew 5. Matthew 6, and then at the end of Matthew 7, the Bible says in verse 28, and so, let me read it. I'm reading New King James. And so it was when Jesus has ended these things that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And there's a burden that was born out of this scripture. The burden of, oh Lord, can you help my life? The way you have helped Jesus. And we are going to see that Jesus himself was compared to the scribes of his generation. And I used to think, you know, I used to think in my heart, Jesus was effective because he came from heaven as the son of God. How won't he be effective? How won't he be, be somebody who will speak with authority? But honestly, beloved brethren, as you look at that scripture, the Holy Spirit is even comparing Jesus with the scribes in his generation. So the question for me was, how can I be one who shares the word of God with authority? How can the Lord impact my life, that my very words, and I'm not saying this out of selfish arrogance. It's not out of, oh, Akin is a great preacher. God forbid. It's not about that. Honestly. Because I know that it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And we're going to see the emphasis of being a, an effective preacher. It's not about the person. Because when you talk about somebody who speaks with authority, we are, we are already immediately, the light is shining on the preacher. God forbid. I'm saying that very emphatically because I know that our center focus must be him, Jesus. That's why we are looking at his example. So what can God do to us to make us Share the word of God with authority as Jesus did. That's the focus of this meeting. We are going to be looking at the preparation of the preacher or, or the teacher of God's word. What preparations do we need to make for our own lives? We will be sharing also what is the goal of teaching and preaching the word of God. What's, what's, the, what's the goal of it? And then... <clears throat> We will share the, around the theme, how to become an effective teacher and preacher of the word of God. 
And I'll be, we'll also be talking about open doors for ministry. Is there a provision for God to share with, to, to show us how we can obtain more opportunities to share his word? Because our generation needs those who will share and teach the word of God effectively, truthfully, and faithfully. We need those group of people in our generation heavily now. A generation that is becoming more and more ungodly. You need people who will turn people to the truth. You need it. And we are not enough. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, the more I'm, I'm seeing so many, many things to do, we are not enough. So, but God can start with us. You can be an instrument to help raise other people who can be effective preachers and teachers of his word. So, that's the burden of the meeting. And I'm praying that you will, you will um, be encouraged and, and um, be challenged this morning. You're welcome. Okay. So, um, we'll take a song. Is the wording, are the wordings up? <clears throat> yes. This is the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we are going to take a song to, um, to focus our hearts. I know, <laughs> actually, this was not the song. It was meant to be, this was meant to be at the end. This is my favorite. I know people who have said, ah, okay. We know you. This is honestly. <laughs> Who should be your vision if not the Lord? Oh, thank you. We are on this. <laughs> We've got to remember it's a prayer, right? Yes. Prayer. So this is prayer as much as prayer, Lord. Yes. For this this meeting. Yes. So we will sing that song, and I will start off with my famous. <laughs> mm, 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 mm.
<coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Don't worry. I will uh, improve. I have a family of those uh, who are constantly prodding me on this issue. So, <laughs> thank you. So, um, we would have Tim come and share with us the preparation of the preacher and teacher of God's word. And after that, we are going to have a time of prayer. So, Tim. I'm coming. Uh, am I on sound? Can you hear me? Anyone hear me? Is it coming through? Uh, Turn up a bit. One, two. You can hear me anyway, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Is it coming through on the levels, on the, on the, on the thing? Not very much. No, on the tally, on the um, recording. One, two. Yeah. Hello. It's still quite low. Oh, dear. Turn it up a bit, then. It's dirty now. Nice. A what? Excuse me. <laughs> Can't manage your Can't hands. Can't get your 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 hands. Can't now you can hear. We can hear everything now. Turn it down a bit. <laughs> okay. okay, right. You'll have to forgive me this morning because I've got a new Bible. So, um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, but, but it's got massive words. So I'm, I, I can see it. This is great. It's really good. So. Oh, right. So... Oh, right, I can relax now. Morning. <laughs> so, um, right, let's pray quickly. Uh, Father, we do thank you that we're all here this morning. And Father, we just ask you that you would open uh, your word to us this morning, that we might come to understand its glory and its meaning, Lord. We ask you would let your word impact our hearts this morning by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... Turn with me, please, to uh, Leviticus chapter 2, please. Leviticus chapter 2. I'm going to do a bit of reading. And I suggest you, if you've got a bookmark or a, or a ribbon or whatever, just stick it in this page because we're going to be coming back to this chapter quite a lot. So. Leviticus, two. Leviticus 2. Okay. Now... When anyone presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and, make, and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and shall take uh, from it his handful of its fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall offer it up in smoke as a memorial portion on the altar as a, an offering of fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord." The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy uh, of the offerings to the Lord by fire. Now, when you bring an offering of grain offering uh, baked in an oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers spread with oil. If your offering is a grain offering made on the griddle, it shall be of fine flour unleavened mixed with oil you shall break it into bits and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. Now, if your offering is a grain offering made in a pan, it should be made of fine flour with oil. And when you bring the grain offering, which is made of these things, to the Lord, it shall be presented to the, priests, uh, to the priest, and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest then shall take up from the grain offering its memorial portion and shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by fire, of a soothing aroma to the Lord. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offerings to the Lord by fire. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. As an offering of the first fruits, you shall bring them to the Lord, but they shall not ascend for a soothing aroma on the altar. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, 
so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Also, if you bring a grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, you shall bring fresh heads of grain roasted in the fire, grits of new growth, for the grain offering of your early ripened things. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it. It is, uh, on it, it is a grain offering. The priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion, part of its grits and its oil with all its incense as an offering by fire to the Lord. I bet you're thinking, what are we going to be doing this morning? Um, uh, just one thing, Sam, can you make sure the, um, the, the room mics are turned down? Sorry, I left them up. My fault. Thanks. Um, yeah, I bet you're thinking, what are we, we going to do this morning? What is this all about? Um, well, uh, before we get into it, uh, I'd just like you to turn to, um, keep, like I said, keep a bookmark in there. We'll come back to that. If you could turn with me, please, to Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Oh. Left my water on the back there. Thanks. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Thanks, Akin. Um, concerning him... Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern uh, good and evil. Um, there's a couple of things in here which I just want to highlight, really, in, in, this, in, this ver in this little bits of verses I've looked at in Hebrews here. And the two things I want to highlight, really, are, first of all, there's a warning in here. Um, and the warning is that if... If the people that we're teaching, if the people we're, uh, we're, 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 we're bringing up in the, in the word of the Lord are, are kept on, on, on milk and never, get, never mature and never come onto solid food, the, there's, a, there's a warning here that, they, um, that they, their, their senses are dulled and they can't discern good from evil. Um, now, most, I'm just looking around the room. Most of you have got have had children or have got children, um, um, and and uh, if you remember when your kids were young and they were they were just sort of starting to toddle around and you know, you know as kids do and just starting to you know get use of their their their, their hands and things, um, they would stick anything in their mouth. It didn't matter what it was. It didn't have to be food even. Remote controls. You know, anything they would, eat, if anything they could, they could get hold of it. They will stick it in their mouth, and that's what that's what infants are like. That's what children are like. They will put literally anything in their mouth, no matter whether it's good for them or not. As they mature, as they grow older, uh, as they as they come to understand the world a bit more and come to understand what food actually is, um, then they know what's good for them and what they should put in their mouth and what they shouldn't put in their mouth. And the same is true spiritually. We we we. Uh, we need to uh, understand that if we if we if we if we're babies if 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 we're infants, then we're in, we're, we're placing ourselves. If we remain infants, we're placing ourselves in danger because we won't be able to tell the difference between what's good and what's bad. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was, it says at the beginning of that in verse eleven, concerning him, concerning who, concerning him, it's talking about Melchizedek. If you went back a few verses, you'd see that what the writer of Hebrews is doing. Is he is he's using Melchizedek as a, as a as a type, and he's using Melchizedek to explain who Jesus is and his ministry and all this kind of stuff. So Melchizedek, he's it's, it's, he's using an Old Testament, relatively obscure set of script verses um, to 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 make an explanation of 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 Jesus and try and give some understanding. So. Um, so what hopefully I'm going to do today is help us use uh, some 
relatively obscure and hard to understand verses uh, as a demonstration, as a, not as a demonstration, but as, as an explanation for how we as preachers and teachers uh, should approach or could approach uh, the, uh, the preparation of the word to, to, to bring to our, um, our brethren. So hopefully we'll be looking at some solid food this morning. That's the plan. So let's, let's whiz back to Leviticus. Um, now, in the time of the, the, the temple, or in this case, the tabernacle, when it's written, um, these scriptures would have effectively been the, the, the job descriptions for the priests. They're a set of instructions. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. You know, so it's, it's, it's fairly easy for us to, uh, to look at this and go, oh, well, that's just an instruction manual for the priests. That's, that's what it is. We don't need to worry about it when we read our Bible on our, whether you do your annual Bible readings or whatever, and you go through, you get to Leviticus, you go, yeah, I've got to kind of get through this and, uh, and then move on. Um, but actually, let's, let's have another look at it. Um, but the, the, you know, for us as Christians, one of, the, um, one of the important things about these scriptures, obviously, is if you think about it, if we didn't have these scriptures in our Bible, if we didn't have the, you know, this is the grain offering, but there's, there's five main, or well, six offerings, but five main offerings um, in, 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 that are outlined in here. And if, but if we didn't have them, we'd lose so much in the way of context about what happens in the New Testament, about the who Jesus is and what he came, what he came to do. So, um, so, for example, imagine John the Baptist, if we didn't have these scriptures, if they didn't exist, imagine John the Baptist saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You go, sorry, the, the Lamb of who, who does what? The, the context for that is all in here. But also, from a typological point of view, we see we see things in these verses, which we use typology and shadow and type to illuminate the doctrines of the New Testament and teachings of the New Testament. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and understand the, uh, the grain offering, which is what this is, is the grain offering. So first of all, we're going to look at a couple of verses. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. We'll quickly do these. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 says, He humbled you and uh, let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but, by, uh, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So what's, what's bread? Bread is made from grain. Grain, bread, it's all uh, typologically, um, bread speaks of the word of God, speaks to the word of God. When, Je when Jesus is being tempted in the, in, the, um, in the wilderness, Satan comes to him, tries to get him to turn the stones into bread, and he's, he quotes this scripture to refute Satan. Um, and you think, you know, in, the, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, um, and you've got, say, for example, it, you remember the story of Elisha in the poison pot when the, 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 the poison food, he puts the flour in. So, you know, the, in other words, typologically, the, 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 uh, the, um, the remedy for bad teaching is good teaching. The remedy for false doctrine is true doctrine. You know, that's, that's what he's doing. Go to, um, if you also go to uh, Amos chapter 8, Amos chapter 8, and you'll see something which is quite true in our day. Amos chapter 8, it, uh, and uh, he's making a comparison here. Uh, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for, uh, for bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. So clearly there's a comparison here between, between the bread and, and, um, word, and, and the word of God. And how true is that in our day and age? Um, but think about, just, you know, the clearest one for me is think about the parable of the sower. When the sower is, 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 is throwing out the seed, what's, what sort of seed is he, is, he, is he scattering? What is it? It's grain. 
It's grain. But what is it? It's the word of God. Yeah. So the grain offering is the, the way I, I see it, and the way I think it's uh, meant to be understood from a typological point of view, is the grain offering is our offering of God's word. And as preachers, that's what we're doing. When we come to, uh, to, to teach and to preach, we're bringing in an offering of God's word. We're bringing an offering of the grain of God's word to, to, the, to, to the Lord. That's what we're doing. So we're going to go through this, and we're going to see what he says. So first of all, there are some things that he says that the grain offering must have. The grain offering must have. And the first thing, as we were going through, I don't know if you noticed it, uh, the first thing that he, he said that we must have, and it's probably the most important thing in the grain offering, is, is the grain offering must be uh, with oil. Must be with oil. Yeah, has oil. Um, we see it, it's, I think it's about nine times I counted, but it, you know, in, in, it start right at the beginning. Verse one uh, says, uh, his offering shall be a fine flour and you shall pour oil on it. Verse two uh, says, so it's, it's handful of its fine flour and of its oil. Uh, and, it, and it goes on, verse four. Um, now when you bring an offering back to grain offering, um, f- fine flour mixed with oil and oil and oil and oil. What does the oil represent in the Bible? The Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Every king and priest and prophet was anointed. You remember when it was poured onto Aaron, it was poured on his head and went all the way down. The oil is poured on. That's the, the picture of the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing that our, our, uh, our grain offering, our, our word that we bring as, as teachers must have is the Holy Spirit. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 10 through 13 we'll look at. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which which things we also speak Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Let that sink in for a minute. I'll just read the the, the, the bit again, a little bit of it again. Uh, No one, uh, uh, even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. And this bit, verse 13, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit. So how can, we, how can we know the thoughts of God? How can we know what God means by his word? How can we know the thoughts of God? Well, the only way we can know it is by the Spirit of God, because only the Spirit knows the thoughts of God. And we can only teach what we have first been taught by the Spirit of God. So we're not here, standing here, to give lectures, you know, academic lectures. We're here to to impart what God's Spirit has shown us. Let's go back to uh, to the grain offering. What's the next thing? So we know the grain offering must have oil. Most important, it must have oil. In other words, it must come from the Spirit of God, our grain offering. What's the next thing that we see? Look at verse, uh, look at verse 1. We'll look at verse 1 uh, again. Uh, pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Verse 2, um, we see in uh, verse 2, his handful of fine flour and, all, uh, and, and of its oil with all its frankincense. 
Um, and then if we whiz down to verse 15, we'll see it again. You shall then put oil on it and lay incense on it. And 16 as well, uh, a memorial portion, part of its grits and oil with all its incense. What is incense? Well, let's look at Revelation 5. Revelation 5 and verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four, um, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp of golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Which are the prayers of the saints. And let's look at, uh, well, let's, let's just think about that, first of all. Um, don't let that pass us by. <laughs> Our prayers go up before the Lord as a sweet aroma, don't they? And that, I don't know how, <laughs> but they're somehow stored up there. They're not, none of them are wasted. None of them are not heard. None of them are, uh, all of our prayers are, are, are received um, by the Lord. And by, by, in some symbolic way, held in golden bowls and presented before the throne. The prayers of the saints. Let's look at how this might work in some sort of practical terms for us as preachers. Uh, let's look at Ephesians uh, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 18. Paul says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this, uh, with this in view, be on the alert uh, with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that in the opening of my mouth to, to make, known the good, make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Pray on my behalf the opening of my mouth. As teachers and preachers, that's what we need. We need to pray for ourselves, and we need the people around us, our, our, our brethren, our, our house groups, our, our congregations, to pray for us as well when we go out preaching and teaching or when we're going to stand at the front and preach. It's, I mean, we do it as, as, a, as a practice, don't we? Very often when Chris or somebody else is preaching, somebody will pray for them beforehand. So our grain offering, our, our grain offering needs to have the Holy Spirit, and it needs to, the other thing it must have is prayer behind it. So our offering of the word must have, have, have uh, uh, the oil of the Holy Spirit and the incense of prayer. What else does it need? Let's look at verse 13 of Leviticus. Go back there again. Verse 13, what's the other thing does it need? Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall uh, not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. What is salt? Well, it's all kinds of things. This is fascinating. I was looking at this, and there was all kinds of things that salt was used of in, in, in the Old Testament times. It was a preservative. And, and, yeah, as a preservative, I was thinking about this. Think about um, Jonathan Edwards. Think about reading, the, the, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you will have read that a sermon by Jonathan Edwards called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I don't know when that was written, but it was a, a long time ago. Has that, has that grain offering that he gave been preserved? Was it salted to be preserved? Yes, it was. Yes, it definitely was. But salt, obviously, obviously the other thing is that salt, we're called to be salt and light, aren't we? What does that, practically, what does that mean? It, it, yeah, it means, to, it means that we, it stands, it, in some way, it stands out. We're different. It's different to normal speaking to people and talking. Preaching should be not the same as just having a conversation. It's something very different. And obviously it would be if it's, if it's filled with the Holy Spirit and, and with prayer. Um, truth, it is truth. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the truth. You're declaring the truth. Um, Taste, flavor, flavor, yeah. 
it makes something to make something salty is to make it tasty, flavoursome. Yes, it was used as a fertilizer. That's one of the other things. It was also used to clean. It was also used as, as a cleansing agent. But what is the word of God? Let's just see what the word of God might say about using salt. And this is, I think, one of probably, not the most important, but probably the, not that it trumps all the rest, but this is important. Uh, let's, let's have a look at um, Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The, I guess what that's talking about is, is, is not smashing people over the head with the word of God. It's, it's, it's coming to the word of God and preaching in a, in a way that's graceful, in a way that's, that's not going to, um, I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't declare the truth and you know, we, should, we shouldn't worry about how people respond in terms of uh, if they're offended by it or whatever, because the word of God is offensive, to be fair, um, to, to, to a lot of people. Um, but speaking with grace, with love to people. I don't, think, I don't see that that's, that's a, big, a big problem to, to do that, to speak gracefully and speak truth. Um, but it's, it, that's what, uh, that's what uh, Paul's uh, alluding to here, that, the, that the, being seasoned with salt is, is grace. Okay, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to uh, Leviticus again. So we've looked at the things that, the, that our grain offering must have. It must have the oil of the Holy Spirit. It must have the incense of prayer and it must have the the saltiness uh, uh, the, the the saltiness of uh, of the salt that's added the grace the preservative the taste but what mustn't it have what mustn't it have let's have a look look at verse 4 now let uh, when you bring an offering of grain offered baked in the oven it shall be unleavened cakes. Verse 5, if your offering is a grain offering made for the griddle, it should be for fine flour unleavened. And verse 11 uh, says, no grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. So let's think about leaven. Leaven is obviously yeast. It's added to bread to make it rise. Um, but the question is, uh, but, but it doesn't add any nutritional value to that bread, does it? When you add yeast to bread, it doesn't add nutritional value. What does it do? Have you got any more bread? No. You've got exactly the same amount of bread more and more air. <laughs> yeah. So, so adding, adding leaven is just puffing it up. And leaven speaks of pride in an individual being puffed up, you know, um, your boasting is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? So pride is, is, is puffs it up. Also, um, leaven, if you think about what it is, actually that gas that is being, is being produced by something that's actually decaying. Yeah? So the leaven is the, leaven is the, 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 the result of what you're getting is the, is the product of something decaying. Well, God's word is the opposite of that. It's not decaying at all. In fact, it's the op if the salt preserves, then the leaven would be the opposite of that, wouldn't it? So it's, it's the opposite of that entirely. But leaven speaks of, of, of sin, doesn't it, as well? And there's another thing, a very important thing um, that, we, that leaven is. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 6, and Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? 
Let's skip down to verse 11. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the leaven that Jesus is referring to here refers to the teaching of the, Pharise of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What was, what was the problem with the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, it was essentially false, but it was also prideful. It was also delivered in such a way as that they were using their teaching as a, a way of, uh, of demonstrating their false authority that they had. The, 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 a position, trying to use their teaching as a, as a, as a marker of their position in their society, um, of their power over the people. That's what they were using their teaching to do, to dominate the people. And it put un, an un, undue burden on the people. But that's, that was how they were, that, you know, that's, that's them putting their, you know, uh, uh, putting, holding them in their place and keeping them down here. So, you, I mean, I don't want to point the finger at individuals, but you know what I mean by heavy, heavy shepherding. You know what I mean by teachers who, who use their platform, who use their, their teaching to, to overbear on people <coughs> and to put people down, and to make people feel inferior. That's not what we're to do. So... Our grain offering must be full of the Holy Spirit. It must have uh, the incense of prayer. It must have um, the saltiness, but it mustn't have leaven. What else mustn't it have? Can I make a point about the yeast? Can I make one? You only need a tiny pinch of yeast to have a disproportionate effect mm. on the whole of the batch. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if, if leaven is effectively the sinfulness of false teaching that comes in, you need a little smidgen to have a disproportionate effect on the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, I t totally agree. Leaven is a very dangerous thing. It can spread and multiply. Um, you can't separate from pride. That pride pops up. Yeah. And I think, I think maybe, maybe the, at the heart of false teaching is pride. Well, I think the pride is the seminal sin. Pride is the underlying sin, isn't it? <laughs> the original sin of Satan was pride. Yeah, pride... And underneath all those other sins, you you find pride, really, don't you? Um, so anyway, what's the? We're well, going back to Leviticus. What's what is the other thing? Look in. Um, look in. It's also hypocrisy as well. By the way, that's the other thing. Hypocrisy is is you know by by teaching one thing and doing something else. That's also leaven, isn't it? That's also part of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, what else uh, in Leviticus, uh, verse eleven? Verse 11, no grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. We just looked at that. For you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord or any honey. There's an interesting thing here with honey. Um, in Hebrew, um, those who've looked at it might already know this, but the, 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 what we say, the, the word, the word of God, the word of God, um, the word word uh, is the Hebrew word dvar, dvar. And it shares, linguistically, it shares a root with the word for honey, which is dvash in Hebrew, dvash. So you've got dvar is honey, dvash is, uh, sorry, dvar is the word, dvash is honey. So the word, um, you know, the, 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 the name Deborah, the, 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 it's a Hebrew word, Hebrew name. The word Deborah is Devora, and it means bee. So Devora, Devash uh, are linked because of the, the, the honey and the bee. And Devash and Dvar are linked, honey and the word. Now, why is this? What's it, what is it about? Well, um, you, you remember, well, in fact, let's have a look at Psalm 119. You've just read it, Chris. I know that. You told me earlier. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Psalm 119. Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole thing. Only one verse. <laughs> uh, verse 103. Verse 103 of Psalm 119. 
verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So God's word, it says here, is sweeter than honey. Um, and if you, th- if you remember in um, Ezekiel, it says, Son of man, feed, uh, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll. And he gives him the scroll, um, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Yeah, the idea is God's word is, is, is already sweet. It's already sweet. We don't need to make it sweeter. By adding honey. I think that if you go to the supermarket, if, you've, if you're going to buy juice or whatever in the supermarket, you'll see the big phrase on the front, no added sugar. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it is. It's, we don't need to make God's word sweeter than it already is. Um, by trying to dress it up and trying to add to it and make it more, um, I don't know, more, 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 more attractive or something, more the palatable, it is sweet already. God's word on its own is sweet, but there's a problem with it. I'll, I'll just say this one thing. Revelation 10 says this. It says, so when I, went to the angel, uh, when I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. In other words, there's the, 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 the caveat, the, the flip side of God's word being sweet in our mouth is we've got to take it in. We've got to take it in and live it. And that's not always as sweet. So, anyway, you were going to say something, Graham? Uh, it's a delicate thing because bringing the word of God is, is, is to be seasoned with salt, but not, not added, honey. added honey. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a delicate thing, then, when you use the word, isn't it? Mm. Because, because salt is about seasoning it so it tastes. Better, but you don't mm. <laughs> Balancing act. Okay, so um, let's go back to Leviticus again very quickly. I want to try and round this off in a minute. Um, so um, verse 2. So just to recap, must have oil, must have incense, must have salt, but no leaven and no honey. That's our grain offering. There's something interesting, a little interesting um, one thing I want to um, add in here. Look at verse um, 2. It says, uh, He shall then bring the, uh, to Aaron's sons the priest and shall take from it a handful of fine flour. Fine flour, okay? So this, this grain offering, as you read through it properly and you go back and read it again, you'll see it's, it's kind of like a, almost like a bread offering, really. There's, there's kind of recipes in here for different types of bread and different ways of presenting bread. But the, the, the ingredient part, obviously, is the grain. But here we see it's fine flour, fine flour. Now, fine flour is ground grains, crushed grain. Um, but in, uh, let's look at verse uh, 14. It said, also, if you bring a grain offering to the early ripened things, you shall bring fresh heads of grain roasted by fire. Fresh heads of grain roasted by fire. Um, Grits of new growth, the grain offering of your early ripened things. So you've got the you've got the whole grain, verse fourteen, and you've got fine flour in other places. So there's a contrast between those two things: whole grain and fine flour. Now the difference between the two is one's been ground already, one's been crushed up already. So if this is God's word, the crushing of God's word is the processing of it. If you see what I mean, it takes hours to take in an old you know on an old mill to take to take you know a bag of grain and to make it fine refined you know really fine flour you know ready for making bread with um so so there's a difference there between the crushed grain the fine flour and the whole grain and i think this speaks i think this speaks of of well two things really i think it speaks of in our preparation for God's word, in our preparation for, 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 for coming to God's word in, 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 and, and taking it out to the people. Sometimes, sometimes we, we, we go to other sources. We listen to other preachers. We listen to, we read books. We look at concordances and, uh, and those kind of things. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with that. And, in, you know, in truth, I think, you know, it, the reality is that 
that even in me pre preparing this, I've done exactly that. I've, you know, I've, I've drawn on teachings I've previously had from other teachers, and I've brought them into my preparation for this. But the whole grain, the whole grain is you as the teacher or the preacher coming to God's word yourself and letting the Holy Spirit speak to you through his word. So it's not one or the other, it's both. It's both. We must crush, we must take those whole heads of grain and we must crush them ourselves to make the offering of the grain. But then there's the, the, the grain which has been crushed for us by somebody else. And it also works in another way, obviously, when we're reading the Bible. You can be reading the Bible just for um, preparation for, for, for bringing God's word. Look at uh, Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra 7, verse 10. It says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances to Israel. So he's studying the word so he can teach it to other people. That's why he's doing it. That's the purpose of it. He's taking God's word, he's studying it, but he's going to share it. Yeah? But then let's look at Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, two sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul of the spirit, both of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So sometimes when we're reading God's word, we're not reading it in preparation for teaching. We're reading it to allow God's, God's word to, to, to speak to us, to change us. To paraphrase, or not paraphrase, to to uh, um, to remind us of uh, of one of Akin's favourite phrases, we must allow God's word to cut our hearts. It has to cut our hearts first. So it's there's there's studying to share, and there's studying just to let God's word affect us. You know, and other as of other verses, Psalm 119, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statues. I will not forget your word. Um, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, in Joshua it says, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do it all according to what is written in it. But then in Timothy, that's, so that's cutting us, yeah, but then in Timothy it says, these things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach them to others. So it's taking the word from other people, taking that crushed grain that's already been crushed by somebody else and taking it out. But then there's the stuff that we have to do, crushing it ourselves. So just to round this up now, really, I just want to, just when well, there's one thing, that one big thing, which hopefully you've all noticed by now that I've completely uh, not talked about. What are all the offerings about? All the grain offerings. What is the most pleasing aroma to the Lord? Jesus. So where is Jesus in the grain offering? Where is he? Well, um, if Jesus is the word made flesh and the grain is God's word, then the grain offering itself is Jesus, the whole thing. Jesus is the offering. He came to fulfill the law. Jesus, Jesus is the grain offering. Um, the oil, as we said, is the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is the Messiah, the Mashiach. We, 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 what does that mean? The anointed one. Jesus himself was anointed with oil. He is that grain offering which has been offered for us. The frankincense. <laughs> Do you remember the, when Jesus, um, uh, obviously, the first place we see frankincense in the New Testament is at his birth. He was... One of the gifts that was given to him is, uh, um, in, 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 you know, in, in the New Testament is that frankincense. And where was he when that was given? Where, where was he? In Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? 
house of bread, just to join it all together here. Um, so, and, and the salt, we saw in verse, when it talked about the, uh, the, the, the salt, it's, it even says it here, every grain offering is all, shall be offered seasoned with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking. The new covenant, we see that it's a memorial in verse, in, um, in verse 2, the smoke uh, as a memorial portion. So the bread speaks of a memorial. What does that remind you of? A memorial of bread. The communion. Bread broken for us. Jesus is the grain offering. But let's look at something else. Look at John 6. John 6. And verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and, uh, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And, and the bread also which I give for the life of the word is my flesh. So Jesus is the bread of life. He is the manna from heaven. He is the grain offering. And of course, we need to find something else in Leviticus chapter 2. The most important thing, obviously, the gospel, the cross, the sacrifice for sin. Where is the cross? Well, I don't know if you noticed in Leviticus that the grain was to be offered in three different ways. Do you remember? I don't know if you noticed. The grain offering was to be offered in three different ways. In verse 5, it's to be offered on a griddle. In verse 7, we see it's to be offered on, in, in the pan. And in verse 4, it says that it's offered in an oven. Well, if you think about Jesus on the cross, the griddle, when the grain is offered on the griddle, Everybody can see what's going on. Everybody can see what's going on. Everybody could see Jesus hanging on the cross. Everyone could see the nails in his hands and his feet. Everyone could see the crown of thorns on his head. Everyone could see the, 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 the flesh that was ripped from his body. Everybody could see the, 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 you know, the, um, the, the gash in his side. Everybody could see the physical suffering that Jesus was going through on the cross, just like everybody could see the grain that's offered on the griddle. Everybody could see that. Then it said he was offered in, that the, the grain will be offered in a pan, verse 7. Grain will be offered in a pan. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Um, verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities." God saw the anguish of Jesus' soul. The priest, when he was offering the grain in the pan, looking down on the pan, could see what was going on. Nobody else around could see what was going on. Only him who looks from above could see what was going on. Only God could see the anguish of Jesus' soul. We could... We can understand it intellectually we can guess at it but we can't un, we can't fully grasp the anguish of Jesus's soul on the cross but God looking down from above could and then finally we have the oven now the oven when the grain was offered in the oven nobody knew what was going on nobody could see what was going on in that oven but on the cross Jesus said my God my God why have you forsaken me there was a moment where there was a separation and only Jesus experienced it. 
a unique experience that only Jesus experienced. So I believe you can see the cross in the grain offering. And so to recap, our grain offering, our offering of the word needs to be, needs to be full of the Holy Spirit, needs to have the oil of the Holy Spirit. It must be backed up with the incense of prayer. It must be salted with grace. It mustn't have any pride, no leaven, mustn't be puffed up, mustn't be false teaching. It doesn't need to be sweetened to make it more attractive. It can be the whole grain and the crushed grain, the grain that somebody else prepared and the grain that we prepare, that we must crush ourselves. And finally, it must have and point to Jesus and the cross. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think when you look at um, what we looked at, first of all, in, um, in, uh, in Hebrews about the solid food and the, and the, and the milk, I was thinking about it as we were looking at the, these, these, these scriptures, which on the face of it, you kind of approach them and go, well, what's that all about? Um, I was thinking that God's... Have you ever been in a, in, a, um, in a commercial kitchen? They have these big cupboards and big, uh, big like, fridges and things, and they call them walk-ins, and, you, and they literally are. You walk into them, and they, and they have everything from a side of, you know, side of beef to like white truffles or whatever. You know, everything you could possibly want is in that kitchen. It's there. And I see that these, these scriptures that seem to be in some way um, inaccessible on first glance, they are like um, those, those kitchen larders where you can go in and you can get so much rich food from and, and meat from. And, they're, and they're, it's like God's delicatessen. <laughs> you know, the Old Testament is like God's delicatessen where we can dive into it and get wonderful food out to bring as our grain offering to the people that we, we teach and that we, uh, uh, and, and we preach to and, and, and are with our brothers and sisters. So uh, that's it for me. I, 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 uh, I thank you for your time this morning and uh, hopefully you've had some meat this morning from, from Leviticus chapter 2. Amen. A bit of a time of prayer in response to what Tim's brought us, and then um, we'll have a cup of coffee and a wee if you need one. And um, I will. So, like, um, am I on? Okay, I'm not. Yeah. So, okay, like he said, would dedicate some time to pray now? I have the roving mic, so if you just want to pray, just so that our brother who is on Zoom can also hear our prayers and be part of it. Yeah. So let's let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you again. Thank you that you have spoken expressly how we should prepare. Lord, help our hearts. We don't want to miss out on what you want to bring to your people. Lord, you have chosen to pass through us to speak and share with your people. But Lord, let not my lack of preparation be the obstructing factor, be the the, the block channel to bring your word to the people. Lord, I ask that you have mercy. Help me, Lord. An unprepared vessel cannot bring he, your word. A vessel that is laden with yeast, with hypocrisy, with sin, with disobedience, with pride, cannot bring your word. Lord, have mercy on me. Help my heart, Lord Jesus. Lord, I must not talk without your grace, without being graceful. I'm only going to kill the people if I do that. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord.
Lord, we just pray that you will, you will imprint these instructions on our hearts. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that um, as Tim has sort of highlighted to us this morning, that there's not a single word that is in your word that's not there deliberately. I thank you that um, we can trace uh, commandments around the grain offering. We can trace it through the manna that you provided in the desert to Jesus who said he was the bread of life, to Jesus feeding the 5,000. To It's all related. It's all, and the seed, the parables of the seed, it's all related and it's deliberate. Everything you said, Lord Jesus, you said deliberately. And, and when, so when we sit before your word, we can look at it, examine it, and go, oh, this, this links with this, and it's deliberate. And I thank you that, uh, like Tim talked about grain offered on the griddle, and, and, and we, we, we can, um, on face value, we can see a man who died on a cross, um, just like tens of thousands of other people died on crosses throughout antiquity. And they all suffered a similar physical plight. But our Lord Jesus suffered in a way that no one has ever suffered. And when we read, when we look at the Old Testament and the way it points to him, we can understand better the magnitude of what you've done. Which is unknowable. We thank you and praise you. I, I, I'm going to say this in my talk, but I believe that we're going to go on through all eternity gaining an understanding of the magnitude of your love for us and the sacrifice you made for us. Thank you. It's an inexhaustible well. And I thank you that the well of your word is deep yeah. and we will not exhaust it in our lifetime. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, whenever we come to teach, to preach, or even when we just read your word, our prayer is this, that may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. Lord, forgive us those times when we are puffed up with pride or self-centered in how we deliver your word. Lord, take that away from us, that we just may focus on you and that we, we may just speak the words that you would have us speak. Amen. Amen. Holy Father, we pray that you'll help us to neither add or subtract from what you have given us, um, whether it's whether it's for ourselves or whether it's when we're talking to others, Lord. Keep us from that pride of spinning in our own desires or what we think is right, Lord. Um, may it always be what you have given us and nothing else. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the immense privileges it is to be called to, to share your word with people in whatever context that might be, whether it's uh, just to a very small group of people, fellow followers of Jesus in our home, whether it's with young people or children, whether it's adults, uh, whatever the location, Lord, just that immense privilege of being able to unpack your word and 
share its truth with other people. We, we just praise and thank you for calling us to that. And, and I pray, Lord, that whatever the context we teach in, uh, to whatever degree, amount of time we, we have to give to it, um, I pray that you would help us to prioritize times of preparation uh, and prayer so that when we stand or even sit to teach, we have put in the work, we've put in the, uh, the time to absorb your word for ourselves and to understand to the best of our ability what it is that you want to say through it. So we thank you for the way that your word has impacted our lives over many, many years, Lord. And we thank you that every time we come to it, there is something fresh there in your word. That's another thing. Uh, the smell of fresh bread is wonderful. But Lord, we thank you that, that your word is always fresh. Whenever we come to it, it's living and active and powerful. So we give you thanks for, for the great joy it is to be purveyors of your word to others. Um, and please help us to do that increasingly, faithfully and effectively. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, yes, Father, we want to thank you for um, your word and unwrapping um, the depths of your word this morning, Lord. And uh, I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, Lord, helps us to understand you and your word and... Um, Lord, I just pray that we we can use that use. Well, we will be a use, Lord, to and we can study Your Word further and deeper, so that um, we can understand that Your will for us and Your will for others, and we can be obedient to that. Um, and I pray for. Um, you mentioned about um, pride and judgment, Lord. I just pray that as we we can find ways to teach others and that um, pride and judgment will not be part of our teaching, Lord. And uh, help us to find ways to teach others that we can use our gifts to bring your love and bring your praise to um others that don't really don't know you yet lord i pray in jesus name amen um tim touched on the ezekiel passage and again in revelation where the scroll was um sweet on the lips and bitter in the stomach and i pray lord that you would help us to know that um because as paul said to timothy that your word is useful for training and teaching and rebuking and correcting righteousness so as we eat of your word it's going to shine a light on us and that's going to be bitter but it's the it's that bitterness that brings us to repentance and we just need to be in a constant state of repentance as your word shines a light on us and Father, let our teaching do the same. In Jesus' name. Lord, we just want to say that you should accept this incense of prayer. Lord, we pray that you will keep working on our hearts. Help us to keep going deeper and deeper into your will and into the purpose for our lives. Lord, even as this meeting continues, we are praying that you will keep breathing on our hearts 
so that we'll be more effective for you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Um, we are going to have a short period of coffee, and I mean short, sorry. <laughs> Our time is fast spent. So we'll just have a short break, and then we'll come for our next session. Um, Graham will be... And like you know, we've, um, it's wonderful to note that this, what we are sharing, is not three messages, as it were. It's still one talk. And so Tim has laid the ground for what Graham will share about, talk about, which is the goal and objective of preaching and teaching. So we would... Um, coffee. Coffee. Um, I think... We'll give ourselves... Ten, ten, ten minutes. Uh, so my, what I'm going to do is um, teach you to suck eggs, I guess. Um, because my... I, I said I would do um, something on the purpose and the goal of teaching the Bible. Um, and I think that's self-evident. I think Tim's probably made it evident this morning. But it's something I thought I would ref reflect on. Um, but can we start looking at Psalm 112, please? So, so this is not where I started, but this is in my quiet, one of my quiet times this week. I thought it was very relevant. So Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He'll be remembered forever. He's not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honour. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. So he's a good guy, this guy, isn't he? Um, I just want you to imagine for a minute if we, had, if, a, if we had a church full of people like this. Like, have a look at the, the guy. He's... Um, um, so uh, in the darkness, light dawns for him, so he can always see light. Think about the character traits of graciousness, mercy, and righteousness. They're an uh, un un um, unusual combination because people tend to be mercy oriented or justice oriented, whereas this guy is merciful, gracious, and righteousness in equal measure. Um, Deals generously, lends, um, conducts, all, conducts all his affairs with uh, justice. He's never moved, like he's rock solid. He knows where he stands. He's steadfast. He's not afraid of bad news. So when things turn a bit bleak, he continues to trust the Lord. And like I said, his heart is steady. He's not afraid in the face of opposition. He distributes freely, he's given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. So imagine what, how effective we could be if we had a whole church full of people who were this stable, this steady, this trusting, um, this steadfast in, in um, affliction, and this generous. Um, but I just want you to have a look for a minute where... It all starts. So what is it that makes this man like this? It's that he fears the Lord and delights in his commandments. So I want to um, park that for a minute. 
because I'm here to talk about what the goal and the purpose of preaching is. But I'm going to return back to that psalm towards the end. Now, to understand what the goal of teaching the Bible is, uh, we need to understand um, what the purpose of a Christian is. <laughs> so Romans 8.29, 8, 8, For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then Ephesians 1 says that um, we who are the first to believe are for the praise of his glory. There's a couple of things, I guess. We are, we're saved, not just so that we can have a joyous, peaceful, eternal existence. We're saved to conform to the likeness of Jesus. And we're saved for the purpose of praising his glory. So the purpose of the Christian is to become more like Jesus. Um, so how do we become more like Jesus? Well, I put to you, it's not um, very often in many churches and teaching sessions, Jesus is held up as an example. Um, and, and same as like the whole classic way of teaching the David and Goliath story is that David is held up as an example. David's this and you should be more like David. Well, Jesus is this and you should be more like Jesus. But Jesus isn't there as an example. He's a saviour. He's a champion. David was a champion. David beat Goliath. Israel were quaking in their boots and were not fit for the fight. It was a fight they couldn't win and they needed a champion. In the same way, our predicament is hopeless. We've got an adversary in death and in um, judgment that we can't defeat and we need a champion. So I don't think we become more like Jesus by people holding, by holding up Jesus as an example and telling people to be more like Jesus. You're telling people to, to be more self-disciplined and um, more dedicated and it doesn't work. Two Corinthians, if everyone can turn to 2 Corinthians 3. So what does the Bible say about how we become more like Jesus? I think we get it here. Now the context of this passage is talking about how Moses, when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and Moses wanted to see God, and God told him, well, you can't see, you can't see my face because no one can see my face and live. But I'll, I'll get all my glory to pass by you and I'll put you in a cleft of a rock. And, um, and when Moses came down, what was, what was going on? His face was shining, yeah. So he would beheld the glory of God and as a result, his face shone. And it shone so much that the people didn't, couldn't look at him. And he had to put a veil over his face to cover it. And in that context, Paul talks about us now, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is spirit. So the word, what other translations have people got for the word beholding? And we all, with unveiled faces, what, have, what else have you got? I've got beholding. Contemplating. Contemplating. Anything different? Reflecting. Reflecting, yep. So the reflecting is interesting because the word means reflecting as in a mirror. So um, as we behold, reflect, contemplate, think on, meditate on Jesus, the glory of Jesus, then we begin to reflect his image. Okay? So that's how the Bible says that we become more, more like Jesus, by contemplating, by reflecting on, by beholding the glory of Jesus. Um, now, I want to take you to Ephesians 3 and Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. So in verse 14... Paul says this, 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the le- length and the height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now there's a, um, there's a lot going on here. I think we could preach, we could probably spend three days on this little passage here, Paul's prayer. But as I see it, this, this prayer uh, resonates quite strongly with a lot of Paul's other prayers for other churches as well. And what does he see as the Ephesian church's biggest need? It's to have the strength to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Jesus that surpasses knowledge. So Paul sees that this is the Ephesian church's greatest need. This is what, and by extrapolation I can say this is what we need to understand the love of Jesus. In the same letter, if we jump to Ephesians 4, and this is um, getting to the nub of it, I think. Starting in verse 7. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And jumping to verse 11. And he gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Your version might say for works of service. For building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. (laughs) So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful, deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And again, there's, not a lot, there's a whole lot in there, three or four sermons. So, um, what I would say is that um, if you're a teacher of the Bible, then your job, our job, is to build God's people up for works of ministry, works of service. And it looks like that God has given, appointed, if you look at the people there, the, um, uh, the list of people, you've got apostles, where are we? Verse 11. Verse 11, yeah, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers. They're all proclaimers of truth, aren't they? Like the apostles are the original proclaimers of truth who wrote the, wrote the Bible. Prophets who would speak truth into a, a, a situation, a God-given wisdom into a given situation. Evangelists will speak, expound the truth of the gospel and our um, need of salvation. The shepherds or the pastors will be those who sit with people one-to-one and speak the truth into their lives. And then there's the teachers whose job is to expound to the congregation the magnificent doctrines of Jesus. And it's these people who are given the job to um, build people up, equip people for works of service. So what does equipping for ministry look like? Well, it's not doing courses. Um, It's not doing a course on prayer ministry or a course on prophecy or understanding psychology better. Um, It's not even doing courses to try and understand um, the culture that we're in. What Paul says is that 
being equipped to ministry is being united in faith and knowledge of the Son of God. And it goes back to um, what Paul said in his prayer. He saw it as Ephesians' greatest need was that they understand the magnitude of God's love for us in Jesus. So being equipped for ministry is not about method. So we can't get equipped for it from doing a course. The only way we can be equipped for ministry is if we know more of Jesus and of his love, which, as Paul says here, surpasses knowledge. And when, like I said before, in the fact I, th- I think we're going to go on learning through all eternity more about his love for us. Like it's an inexhaustible thing. It's unknowable, as it were. Um, so we're never going to go to a point where so we can say, oh, yeah, I the love of Jesus, I know that, I know everything about it. We're not going to get there. Now, Chris said in the commissioning service last week for the new leaders that MCF has always been committed to a full member ministry model and that's utterly biblical because Peter calls all Christians, doesn't he, as a kingdom of priests. So that means that the whole church is supposed to be in some way, shape or form arbiters between Jesus and the world. We're supposed to represent Jesus to the world just as Jesus represents us before God. So We are committed to a full member ministry, but God has given some gift, given these gifts to the evangelists, prophets, teachers, pastors, to build people up for works of ministry, uh, works of ministry, so that we can all do the full member ministry thing. So when Paul says um, in Romans 8, that we're predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. And then in 2 Corinthians, we see that it's, it's in contemplating him that we begin to emulate him. Then our part as Bible teachers in building people up and preparing them for works of ministry is to preach and teach Jesus. Now, the whole Bible, as Tim's eloquently put to us this morning, is about Jesus. So Jesus didn't come, like I said before, he didn't come as an example to us. He came as our champion. He came to save us because we had no hope of saving ourselves. And the whole Bible points towards that salvation. Like we said before, it's a deep, deep well. So as preachers and teachers, our job and as Tim put it this morning, is to grind the grain, grind the word, and find in it the glory of Jesus and his salvation. And it's always there. And our message needs to be constantly that we're utterly dependent on what Jesus has done for us, what he's doing in us, and what he's going to do. And I guess the thing is that our teaching our pre- teaching and preaching will always be full of hope because he is utterly reliable to do those things. He's utterly reliable to save us from our past, to save us on long, in long going, con- um, ma- making us more like him, and to come back and take us home. So I started with Psalm 112. And it says, blessed is he who fears the Lord. And I think that understanding our utter dependence on him equilibrates to fear of him. Um, So what do I mean by that? I think a lot of people imagine that fear and love are mutually exclusive. But I actually think they're quite close bedfellows. So I love my father, and my father, I never, ever felt um, threatened by him in any way, shape, or form. But I feared him. I feared his reproach. I feared losing his trust. Um, But when we see and when we proclaim the the fact that um, we're utterly dependent on Jesus for our every breath, 
We're utterly dependent on him for our daily bread. We're dependent on him for his mercy for the filth that is inside us. We're dependent on him to save us from death because death separates us from everything that's good. And this is all in his hands. And I think that's fear. You know what I mean? You're like you've got no, there's, there's nowhere, there's no universe where we can stand on our own two feet and be independent. And I think that's fearing the Lord. It's understanding that we are utterly at his disposal. But he's good, <laughs> good to save, and he's shown us that. So therefore, I think our goal every time we preach or teach is to cause our audience or our study group or whatever to consider, to contemplate, to reflect on Jesus and his love for us and his glory. So that as we do that, it will necessarily lead us to worship because we always, like worship and praise is a necessary um, part of enjoying and understanding something that's so good. And then as we um, reflect on him, we're becoming more like him and we'll want to do his bidding. Remember what he said, he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. But at the core of that is love. And of course, John says that we love because he first loved us. So the thing I haven't talked about so far is the Holy Spirit. Because every part of the process of this teaching the Bible is dependent on the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So as Tim has already said, and it dovetails really perfectly, we need to pray and rely on the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the glory and the love of Jesus in the Word, in whatever passage it is that we've been appointed to teach, so that he can open our eyes and then we marvel at what he's done and then we're ready to tell other people, to communicate to them more about the love of God in Christ. And then in doing so, hopefully, like it's the Holy Spirit then who will then open the eyes and the ears of the congregation to hopefully see the same thing. And in doing so, little by little, our congregation become more like him and therefore more prepared for ministry. So now I open the whole thing with Psalm 112 and that's where I'm going to finish. Who are we looking at when we look at Psalm 112? <coughs> and it's actually worth looking at the comparisons between Psalm 112 and Ephesians 4. You know, this Ephesians 4 talks about us not being tossed here in the way and being steadfast. This guy in Psalm 112 is steadfast. Well, I put it to you when you read um, Psalm 112, it's describing Jesus. There's not a single line in Psalm 112 that isn't applicable to Jesus. But if we're going to have a church full of people who are like this guy in Psalm 112, then we need to continually and constantly put Jesus in front of them. His salvation, what he's done, what he's doing, what he's going to do. And as, as Tim's already shown us, that the Old Testament informs that <laughs> and deepens that understanding that we can read about in the New Testament. They go hand in hand. So the goal of preaching and teaching is to present Jesus. It's like holding him up like a, I mean, it seems almost um, blasphemous to say this, but it's almost like holding up a diamond, like the jewel, um, the pearl of infinite worth that he talks about in the parable, holding up and just turning it round so people can see from different angles and see its beauty from every um, position. And that's our job as preachers and teachers to show Jesus and the glory of his salvation and his love for us. 
Anyway, let me pray. And then we'll hear from Paul, I think. Uh, this, just, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Um, bringing what you were talking about, value. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, the value of doing courses and so on. Mm. I just want to double check what you do mean and what you don't mean. I think what you're saying is, as the, uh, doing a course to further equip you and help you. I'm thinking in terms of what Tim was talking about earlier about the the, ref, the refined flour, the, the flour that's been yeah. prepared. There's it's good to learn from people who have more experience and more knowledge and, mm. and, and so on. What you're not saying is no, no courses are of value. No. I just want to double check. I, I don't think that's what you meant, no. but I just what, wanted to double check that. What I... I I'm suspicious of a method. Because ministry... The full... Because what I... The, the, the more we understand and see and comprehend the love of Jesus and his salvation, the more we love him in response and then ministry flows out of that. And, and the thing is we can, be, we can go to a course and learn a method and have a heart as cold as stone and a ministry will never be effective. I'm not saying courses are pointless, but they're not the secret to... Effective ministry. The effect of, the effective ministry will always come from an authentic heart that loves Jesus. And so as I see it, there's Paul Paul and others might correct me, but there's three really clear evangelistic mandates in Scripture. There's the Great Commission, and we all know that. There's the um, Peter says, always be ready to give a reason for your hope. Okay. And then there's Jesus himself says, um, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. By this, the world will know that you're my disciples. So, if, if, so the Great Commission, you know, is the mandate of the church. Um, always give a reason for your hope, presupposes that you walk around exuding hope. So it makes people question. And then the love of one another as I've loved you, by this the world would know that you're my disciples, means that the way we love one another in itself is evangelistic. But they all come from an authentic heart. Like that, th that hope is comes from understanding that we're utterly dependent on him for everything and there's absolutely nothing that we can do to save ourselves and so all our hope is in him. And it's a genuine and sure hope. So that's what I mean. I think the equipping for ministry is about loving him. It has to be. Does that disagree? Sorry? Personally, I think it's both ends. Yeah, I, I think, I think I, 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 I totally and utterly agree with what you've just said, mm. but I also think, and it's different from one person to the next depending on their gifting and what they've got, that some, some of us um, spending time with people that are, are, are very experienced in how to, you know, there's practicalities. You know, mm. you may be a completely gifted speaker. But you've got to have the depth, you know, we've been talking about this all, you've got to have the depth behind you mm. to make sure that what you're saying is correct. And I, I feel, you know, I've, I've never done a, a Bible college course, but I'm, I'm sure there's people here that have done, well, I know Chris has, but I think there's others here that have, have been to Bible, Bible colleges and things like that. And that's... That's, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say is there is value in those oh, there's things. there's massive value in going to... In fact, I've said... Uh, that, I've and said that, that's what I'm worried about is that unintentionally, I think you, you may have given some people the impression that there's no value in that. Yeah, OK. So I, I think the... College, the yeah. you, you, had a, you had a syllabus, you had a schedule. Mm. People didn't just come in and preach Christ to you. They we studied the Bible. Sorry? We studied the Bible. You studied the Bible, yeah. yeah. But it, you were trained in how to study the Bible. Yeah. And 
you know, there was method yeah. in that teaching. It, you know, they would not still be a college if they had no method in no. their in their but, way of teaching. So I think I agree with Jerry in that in that there is a place hmm. for a structured kind of learning about particular topics relating to scripture that don't necessarily involve preaching Jesus. Yeah. No, I I guess what I'm saying is that, that, that ministry isn't a primarily about a method. Do you understand what I mean? So, so it's not like... So an example could be the Alpha Course. So you do the Alpha Course and use, use this method, it will be effective. But the Alpha Course will... Unless, they, um, unless the hearts of the people leading is authentic and they love Jesus, it'll be useless. Yeah. That's the motivation. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's the motivation. Yeah. Can I can I say something? Yeah. Um, I, I think there are two equally equal and opposite um, um, fallacies. One is to say that that you cannot preach, you cannot teach unless you've had the training, unless you've been and got the the degree and the and the and the Bible mm. course and all the rest of it. And the the opposite of that is to say that. No, 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 no. It's nothing to do with that. It's all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about it being spirit-filled, and, and you don't need to go to Bible courses. And mm. if you do, then you're just a fool because you're not relying on the Holy Spirit. So those two positions at either end of the spectrum are equally and opposite, but they're equally wrong. Mm. You know, and, and, and I think that we see that demonstrated in the Bible with you know, Peter and, and, and John, who had no, you know, no formal training. You know, and when they mm. come and, and, and preach... People are marvelling at the fact that these uneducated, and uninformed men are speaking with such eloquence and such mm. power. You know, and we see that, that that's coming from them. But then we also see Paul, perhaps one of the most educated and, and, and well-educated and, inf and informed and trained men that, that ever lived in that time, mm. doing the same thing. Mm. So I think we have to be careful not to, not to try and push either of those sides no. away but we have to know that the, the words we're speaking, as I said, as I said when it was earlier on, we have, we have received these things from the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. Hmm. So, so that, that's, that's where we should kind of start at, I yeah. guess. Training is, is, is an education is, is fine in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Can I land it here that I'm not saying I, I didn't want to be understood that the courses are not useful but they're a, a course about, like, I'm not saying a book, because I said to both my boys, if ever you want to go to Bible college for a year and a gap year, I'll pay for it. Because it was such a valuable year for me, just to, to, to spend a whole year just dedicated to studying his word. And I'll, it's the most valuable year I've ever had. Um, but, um, but if we go and do a course on a method, that doesn't bear fruit. What bears fruit is people loving Jesus and, and their ministry is an overflow of that. So, so as a, you're saying is, if you're going there to tick a box, yeah. then there's no value to it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. what I totally agree with. And there's people at Bible college, remember when I was at Bible college, one of the first things they said to us is a third of you will not be Christians in 10 years. <laughs> and that's statistically true. So there's people there whose hearts, for whatever reason they're there, their hearts are not right. Um, but as a preacher and teacher, the thing that we're trying to, the thing that we all need to be like, more like Psalm 112 character, which is Jesus, more like Jesus, and the only way we become more like Jesus is not by trying harder, it's by loving him more. It's by seeing him better. It's by, and so our job, I think as preachers and teachers is to hold him up and, and it's, it's all through the word. So that's what I'm saying. I don't mean there's no point to have courses. It's not the method though, allowing the Holy Spirit to, to work through us to open up the word and enlighten us. Does it, don't the two things work together? I think what because Tim... The love, to be able to love for more, you've got to allow the Holy Spirit surely to open your heart. And it's... It's interesting that what Paul says in Ephesians, in his prayer in Ephesians 3, is that, that, that the Ephesians, I mean, I'll go back to it. It's full, this passage. 
that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through, the, through his spirit in your inner being. So the whole thing is Holy Spirit dependent so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the, length and the depth and the height. So there's basically you cannot have a knowledge of this love without the Holy Spirit. And, and as Tim said in his um, preparation talk, um, if the oil, the oil represents the Spirit in Scripture and you never bring a grain offering without oil. So the, the Spirit is involved 100%, but there's, the Spirit is no less involved in spending 30 hours reading and studying and making notes on Scripture than he is sitting with your eyes closed praying and contemplating. It's no good going to the Bible college without the Holy Spirit. Right? Exactly, yeah. Well, that's, and as I said, 30% of people go to, went to our Bible college fallen away. Anyway, let's pray and then we'll hand over to Paul. Um, Father, thank you that we've got a meeting of minds. Um, I, I, love, I love how there can be clarity. I love, um, I love it when every time I spoke from the front, people could ask questions like Jerry did because I know that um, I'm a limited... I'm limited by my humanity and I will say things that can be misunderstood. But thank you that your word, like we said before, is f- there's not a word in there, it's not in there deliberately. Um, it's your word, it's living and active and powerful. And it's always pointing towards our Lord Jesus and the magnificence of what you've done for us. And, um, and I pray, Lord, that two things, that whenever we're preaching and teaching that Jesus would be central. Um, That in our preparation we would gain a better understanding of the magnitude of your love for us in Jesus. And that, Lord, that what we preach and teach would give our um, study group or our congregation reason to glorify you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul. (coughs) All right. Okay. See, I can sit him down there, so I presume that must mean he's happy for me to go ahead. First of all, Uh, Can I concur with what has been said and have been thoroughly blessed by what has been said already? And I trust that whatever I say will just be an addition uh, to what has been said. That's certainly my desire and prayer. I've been asked um, to bear in mind, my part says, the effective minister of God's word, Matthew 7, verse 29 And Matthew 7 and verse 29 says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So it's obvious that they had had an example, which they were used to. And that's the people of the Lord's day were used to listening to the scribes. And there was something about the way that they talked uh, that just lacked that authority. It lacked something. There was something missing. And from that point of view, when the Lord Jesus Christ came along, they noted the significant difference between the way that the scribes preached and the way that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. And so with that in mind, let's just consider where or how did the Lord get his authority? Where did it come from? What's the secret behind it? And uh, is there any way that we could enjoy that authority too? Well, for me, the secret is revealed uh, at the end of the Lord's ministry, remembering, of course, that Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29 comes quite early in the Lord's ministry, very early in the Lord's ministry. Uh, But now we have at the very end of the Lord's ministry, in John chapter 14, the Lord really begins to unbear his heart uh, to his disciples and, the, you know, everybody thought the Lord has such authority. But now the Lord begins to explain to his disciples, 
this is how it is that my words are different. This is how it is that my words make such impact. And so I would love you to turn with me, please, to John chapter 14. And I want you to notice um, that Philip has asked a question. Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us or it will be. That'll be sufficient. That's all we need, Lord. Just show us the Father and that'll be everything. And, and the, the, the Lord looks at Philip and says, Philip, have I been so long time with you? And thou hast not known me. He says, do you not understand who I am? Um, so <clears throat> then in verse 10, uh, he, uh, he says this, and I want you just to notice the words because they're very careful. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? So he's saying, I live in the Father, and the Father lives in me. There's an indwelling which allows me to live in the Father and the Father to live in me. That's critical. Let's bear that in mind. He says, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Or maybe your translation might say something to the fact is, they're not my words. <laughs> okay, here's a disclaimer. Those words that you thought were tremendous authority, they're not mine at all. Well, whose are they? But the Father, they're the Father's words. That same Father that dwelleth in me. He says, not only does is the words his, but he says, the works, they're his as well. He says, he doeth the works. Now, what is the Lord Jesus Christ basically driving at? He's saying, well, really, I'm only a conduit. I'm a mouthpiece. I am, as Paul used later on, an ambassador, and I am repeating what I have been told. I am repeating what I have been told. Now, let's just, it's not good to build a doctrine on one verse of Scripture. Far from it. And so let's just follow that through for a wee moment and see, is there anywhere else that something similar is said? And uh, yes, many, many places. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to confine myself to just a few, not because of the sake of your time, but for the sake of all our time. We could spend days at this. But let's just look at verse 24 of, my, of John chapter 14, verse 24. And here he's talking about the response of the disciples. And he says, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So he says, if a man doesn't keep my sayings, he's not really mine. He's, he's no. But he says, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So he says, the words that you, forget about those who have no time for me and my sayings. But he says, you, you listen to my sayings. And the words that you're listening to, they're not mine. Well, whose are they? They are the words of the one who sent me. And he's very specific. But the fathers which sent me. You know, I, <laughs> if there's anybody ever had authority in this planet, anybody has ever had authority in the universe, it's God. And if the Lord Jesus Christ was seeking to stand before people and repeat what God was saying to him, there is no wonder that what he said had authority. Absolutely no wonder about it whatsoever. It had authority. Okay, let's turn to one more verse of Scripture just at this point. John chapter 17 and verse 14. And here the Lord is actually now not talking to the disciples. He's not talking about himself, but he's in prayer and he's talking to his father. And he's saying, I have given them, I have given to the disciples thy word. <laughs> not my word. Lord, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And so there the Lord is talking back to his heavenly father and he's saying, Father, I've given them the word that you gave to me. 
I gave it to them, and I have completed the task that you asked me to do. I have completed that task. I know that for anybody here that is listening in today that has ever preached the Word of God, there are those times and seasons as you're seeking God's face, and you know the message that you have for that particular occasion is one that is really much just burning in your soul. And you go into that pulpit, or you go before that congregation, you go into that Bible study class, and you just know this is the Lord's Word. Okay. I can assure you, you will agree with me, that when you go in with that sort of confidence, you speak with authority. There is a note about that message that has an impact it has authority. And what I want to say to you today is that that should be our passion and desire for every occasion. It may not always happen, I'll not say it, it does, but it certainly should be our desire that on every occasion it would happen. And, and the Lord doesn't fail. He's not in the business of failure. And uh, don't be concerned about that. You say to me, well, how does this work out practically? Well, let's look, look at how it worked out practically for the Lord. And remember, of course, that the Lord Jesus Christ was in many situations, same as us, and he couldn't throw the whole Old Testament, which is the Word of God that he had available to him. He couldn't throw the whole Old Testament at the people that he was preaching to or speaking to or in any concurrent situation that he found himself in. Rather, he quoted selected verses, a verse here and a verse there. And those verses had tremendous power, power with the devil, as we can see in his temptations, power with men, power with congregations, power with his disciples. And you ask yourself, well, Lord, how, how did he know to, to use that particular scripture? How did he know that that was the particular scripture that was one that he wanted to uh, particularly uh, approach and, 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 and benefit from on that particular occasion? And the secret for that is found in Isaiah chapter 50. And verse 4, and I'd love you to turn to Isaiah chapter 50, and we'll look first of all at verse 6. Um, verse, well, we'll read verses 5, and no, no, we'll just go to verse 6. Don't want to give them a secret away yet. Okay, verse 6, and it says this, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I had not my face from shame and spitting. Okay? Now, who is that prophecy about? And of course, the answer is, that is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. I gave my back to the smiters, and he certainly did, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, I had not my face from shame and spitting. Okay, so the passage that I'm going to read to you now in a moment or two is a prophetic passage about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, how did he operate? How did he know what message to give to any particular people at any particular time? And the answer is found here in this passage. Go with me to verse 4, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. Now the word me there, and there's another word I coming up in a, a couple of words later, is the same me and the same I that we have in verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. So if we have agreed that verse 6 is about Jesus, then verse 4 is also about Jesus. Okay? So the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. Why? That I should know how to speak a word in season 
to him that is weary. Oh. Folks, that authority that we're speaking about, he taught them as one having authority, was always, first of all, a word in season. A season, of course, is a specific time, and we think of seasons as being four of them in the year, but it's a word that is timely, a word that is fitting, a word that is suitable for a particular occasion. And he said, the person who teaches me that word is the Lord God. He gives it to me. Amen. Oh, why would the Lord God Almighty, the Son of God, have to wait on his Father to be taught a word? Well, that's one of the great mysteries of the Godhead. And I am not take away from the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have learned all of these things, or he already knew all these things because he's God and you can't teach the Lord anything or whatever. You can look at it whatever way you like. But I believe that the Lord operated on earth the way he wants us to operate, to teach us how we should live and minister and be involved in God's work. And you know, the Lord wants to teach you a word in season. And he wants us to learn a word that's timely, that's timely. And that timely word will be for someone. It will be for a person who is weary, a person who is tired. Weary people and tired people find it hard to do things. They have hardly any energy left. Oh, they're exhausted. And they need someone to give them something in season that will lift them out of their exhaustion, that will lift them out of their weariness, will point to them the way out of their current uh, troublesome circumstances. And Jesus said, I don't have a list of things which I just throw at people because I have them and uh, I pluck them out of here, there and everywhere. But he said, my father teaches me the tongue of the learned. I've had to learn this the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak. And he said, I don't throw the Bible at them. I give them a word. And I give them a word that is timely. It's the right word for the right time, for the right circumstances. A man that is weary. Now, when did he get this word? This is again still the Lord Jesus, still prophecy concerning the Lord. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. And so the Lord, you know, you wonder, well, why did the Lord spend so much time in prayer? I'm sure, I mean, like the Son of God who knew everything and knows everything. And, you know, why would he have to go away? and be up early before the dawn, seeking his father's face and talking. Well, here's one reason. There are many reasons, but here's one. He says, he wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the learned. In other words, there's something that I want to hear from my father. Because what I hear from my father morning by morning is for the people of that day. I don't have to worry about tomorrow's people and how tired and weary the people are tomorrow because he's going to awaken me morning by morning and there'll be a message tomorrow for the people of tomorrow, but he has wakened me today for the people of today. And you know, when we begin to operate this in the same way as the Lord operated, and I believe it, and the Lord was setting us an example here as to how we're to fulfill ministry. When we are being wakened morning by morning, saying, Lord, I'm going to go out today and meet needy people. I'm going to go out today and meet people that have, oh, so exhausted, so drained, so tired, 
And Lord, what am I going to say to them? What am I going to give to them? How am I going to help them in some way? You know, it didn't say, no, one week previous. No, no. He said, today I'm going to give you a word. Now, <laughs> building on what has already been said, let me hasten to add that no preachers to go out and just preach boof, straight out of their head. That preacher is going to take the grain and the fine flour and the things that the Lord has been blessing him with, and the Holy Spirit is going to bring those things to his remembrance, and that word will immediately come to mind. You know, whenever I saw my uh, subject um, that, that I can give to me, um, immediately I just knew this is the word of the Lord. It actually came yesterday, but shh, I was praying about this yesterday. And uh, the, the verses that I'm looking at now immediately came to my heart yesterday. But those were verses that I had studied a long time ago. Those were verses that I had studied very carefully with the young people last year. Um, those were verses that have blessed my heart repeatedly. But whenever I began to think about what am I going to look at, Lord? What is your message? What is your message to the folks in Martyr? Then immediately this passage came to my mind. That is what gives me authority. When I know this is the Lord's message, and I have already learned what these verses, I think, mean, and I'm still learning more from them. Tremendous verses. He weakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord hath opened mine ear. And then I want you to notice something else about it. See what the Lord was hearing. He said, I was not rebellious. I, I didn't reject it. I didn't say, no, Lord, that's not a message. I don't want that message. I'm not. No, no. He said, I accepted it because I knew where this message was coming from. It was the Lord opened mine ear. I heard I wasn't rebellious. I responded to it, neither turned away back. Even though the message that he might have heard and did hear on mornings, and he began to share with his disciples and had been over the last few months of his ministry, was a message of pain, message of suffering, message whereby he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of evil men, be tried and be crucified, would die, be buried and rise again the third day. Not an easy message, but he says, I didn't turn my back on it. I wasn't rebellious. In fact, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Oh, it was a word in season for the weary, but it wasn't a word without its cost. It wasn't a word without uh, its own personal pain. It wasn't a word that didn't come without its own personal trial. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be faithful. And you know, today our subject is for them that taught as one having authority. And I've been thoroughly blessed by the word of God I've already heard by both uh, Tim and Graham. And I thank God for it. And it, it did come across to my heart as, as having authority. And I've been making notes here and listening carefully. And I praise God for it. But what, what gave it so? Because I believe that you were seeking to listen to what, what is the word for today? What's the word for this morning? And you know, when you and I have that burden, Lord, I don't want to stand in front of people and, uh, you know, give them a message of enticing words. Listen, listen to this. Oh, there, there are dozens of verses, and my time's nearly gone, so I'm going to stop. But listen to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words. The scribes used wisdoms of words, you know, fancy words. Why was Paul concerned? Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 4, my speech and my preaching, this is chapter 2 and verse 4, should I say, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And, you know, we've already heard all about that and uh, the oil on the fine flower offering. Absolutely. Amen. I agree with that totally. But, folks, 
How will that happen? That will happen whenever we're preaching the Lord's word. We can expect the Holy Ghost to be poured out upon it. We can anticipate that. And then 1 Corinthians 2, 13, and I thought, my thunder's going to be stolen. He says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. In other words, I'm not standing up here just trying to proclaim something that man has put together, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Who taught Paul to say what he said in Corinth? The Holy Spirit. And you know, whenever God is impressing upon our hearts, the word for any particular occasion could be one-to-one, -one, personal witness. It could be in a congregational type setting. If that is what is happening, then I want to assure you, your words will come across to the congregation as having authority. The Lord bless what I've said. Amen. Back to you, Akin. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm just becoming. Let me control myself now. And um, we, we should, we should pray. Let's just ask God for help. Let's. Talk to him so that we will, in his mercy, obey these things. You know, I. Which other Bible school do you need? I'm not saying you don't need Bible school. Please don't misunderstand me. Uh -huh. Look at this Bible school here in Isaiah 50. Morning by morning Bible school. Do you see that your Bible school doesn't finish? It doesn't end by attending more lands. You continue that Bible school morning by morning. You see, and I'm just praying, God, can you help me that I will not be a dropout from your divine Bible school? It seems to me that it's progressive. Your, your own teaching, your own learning from the master does not finish. We need it. Money by money, daily, as the Lord will help us. So I just feel we should just take some time to pray and ask God for help so that we can look up to Him. So I'll, I'll just start off in prayer and then please I'll open it up so that you, you also pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you again that your word has come and you've not, you've not held back. You showed us the truth. You've opened up our understanding. How was it that, Lord, you were effective? How was it that you spoke authoritatively? You've told us now your, the words you spoke were your words. Words that were taught by the Lord unto Jesus. And so, Lord, we are praying. Can you help me? Can you help us to be true students of the word? Students that can submit our hearts to you to be taught that you can give us a word in season. Not because we cooked up those words by ourselves, but you were the one that gave it to us. Lord, can I be receptive to you in mercy? Help me, Lord, to be humble, to receive from you. Help me. Help us, Lord, that your word to us will be words that you have taught us. Your own words. Thank you, everlasting Father. We just pray again that you will imprint this truth onto our hearts. In Jesus' name, we've prayed.
So, um, my in my experience, I have not um, spoken fully with authority because, for the sake of peace, I shy away from saying some things or saying some things in certain ways. And this scripture gives us a, an example of, of Jesus here. He said, I was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. That's how, I don't like to be smitten, <laughs> and um, I don't like shame and spit, spitting. But Lord, I thank you for the, consol for the consolation, for the confidence we have in you. Verse 7 says, I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. So Lord, I, I pray for myself and for everyone here that might be in the same situation where we've been... We've shied away from speaking your truth, the word that you have put in our mouth for the day, because we don't want to upset people or we want to be in everyone's good books. Lord, I pray that your truth will always prevail and will come out. And when you've put your truth in our mouth, it, it, it comes in love, because you've instructed us to speak the truth in love. So. Lord, I pray for more of your truth and more of your love so that the word that you have in season for the people around us will be given to them. They will not be starved of your word, but they will be um, blessed with the life that you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name. Um, just a little thing. When uh, I've done a fair bit of youth work over the years, and one of the games that people play or icebreakers will always say, um, will do is say, what if you could have a superpower? What would you have? What superpower would you have? And most people want to fly or whatever. And I said to the kids, um, I would love to have the right words to say at the right time to influence change. <laughs> and I don't mean for my ends. Um, and Paul has just shown us a scripture and unpacked a scripture to us this morning that shows us it's possible to have that superpower. Because all wisdom comes from you. You are the source of all wisdom and knowledge. And if anyone is going to have a word to say at a time to influence change, it's you. And morning by morning, Lord, um, let us be those who seek your word for today, that we might be your, um, your voice in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just reminded of that verse. Morning by morning, new oh. mercies I see. Oh. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, okay. Lord, unto me. Amen. Amen. I 
was just thinking um, about um, a word from this week, Lord, where um, we were looking at, I was looking at Moses and uh, he said he took 30, uh, 40 years thinking he was somebody, 40 years realizing he was nobody. And at that point, Lord, you called to him and uh, he said, um, but I, I don't speak well, Lord, choose choose somebody else and uh, he then spent the next 40 years realizing that God can use a nobody I just take great encouragement from that Lord and just really um, uh, kind of overwhelmed by the responsibility of teaching your word but I just know that with your help with your spirit that you can speak through it through a nobody and thank you for that amen Holy Father, we pray that uh, anything that w comes out of our mouth, that when we're speaking um, to others and influencing others, that it will always come from you. Um, protect us, Lord, from uh, our own experiences and our, our own influences that would seek to sneak in and, and influence what we're saying. Um, help us always to speak your truth, but also always remember to speak your truth in love. Sometimes that love has to be tough, but it always has to be in love. Yeah. Keep us, Lord, from the negative Im impression of the word preach, which uh, the world has twisted to be something of yeah. shouting in people's faces and condemning and judging. Yeah. And help us to be that word that Paul, Paul said about reaching to those that are weary and exhausted yeah. and lifting them and showing them Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, you've just um, sort of dropped into my head, really, uh, about Jesus and his preaching and teaching, and just reminded me that there's only one section in the Gospels that's particularly referred to in the notes as a sermon, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. We all know about that in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7, and, and that was obviously a very powerful message, and it was forthright teaching but we thank you on many more occasions Jesus just told stories and help us to to see the power in story too and uh, your story most of all obviously Lord your own story um, because that's the most important story we can ever tell but help us also see the value of stories in illuminating uh, teaching and preaching and uh, helping to s people to see um, parallels um, between what Scripture is teaching us and, and what's happening in our lives. So, Lord, I guess everyone in this room longs to be a more effective uh, preacher, teacher, whatever word we want to use, a communicator of your words. And so I pray that you will help us uh, increasingly to be that, not just to be speaking to the wind, um, mouthing words, um, endlessly gabbling on, but Lord, to be really effective in the way that we communicate your word to people so that they understand its meaning clearly and they can see how that word can be applied in their lives day by day. So we thank you for the model of preaching and teaching that the Gospels present us with through your ministry, Jesus. And we pray that we might become more and more like you in the way that we speak to people about the kingdom of God and, and all that that entails. Thank you for the enormous privilege of being able to do that day by day. 
We give thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you. <clears throat> thank you for how you've led us through this meeting. We just pray again that you will help us obey you. Remind us again and again of this truth so that we can apply it to our lives. Thank you. For in Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. It just dawned on me that because I was going to take a short um, theme on open doors for ministry, opportunities for ministry. And it dawned on me while I was sitting there. I would say, I believe it's the Lord that just said it very clearly to my heart. Go and obey these things. And opportunities to share God's words will come. There's no method to it. Just go and live by what we've heard this morning. And God will open those opportunities to share his word, to reach more people, to affect more lives. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will help us. Um, I will, I trust that God will give us other opportunities to talk about what I was going to talk about later. Well, because of our time, I will just leave it at that. Let's trust God to help us apply these instructions to our hearts. And the, and the more we do it, God will say, okay, fine, you've obeyed me. Please, let me use you to do this for more people. As you apply these things to your life, those opportunities, God will open it. Because it's not actually us that is clamoring for place to preach. No. Or people to go and share with. It's God that opens those opportunities. If you remember, John, disciples, came to Jesus. No, John's disciples came to John in John chapter 3. It was very interesting. They came and met Jesus. They came and met John the Baptist and said, The man you baptized, everybody is going to him. Everybody is now going to him to be baptized. I thought, John, you are John the Baptist. Do you imagine? They were, there was an offense created that all of a sudden, Jesus is now stealing the show. But John had to tell them very clearly in John chapter 3. A man does not receive anything except it has been given to him from above. So, just to say again, as you are trusting God to be of more use to him, go to God for those opportunities. No need to fight anybody. No need to say, oh, no, I must be the one to preach. No. <laughs> God is the God that opens those doors. And you see, like I said, let's just go and obey these things. And God, in his mercy, will open those doors for us. I trust the Lord will help us. Let's, we want to thank our brother, um, Paul. He has really been a blessing to us this morning. Paul, thank you very much. Um, I will just pray briefly for, for him as we round up as well. Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you for our dear brother, Paul. Thank you for the ministry you have given him. Thank you for the brethren he, you have placed um, with him to, to help shepherd. Lord, we thank you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will continue to bless him continue to enrich his own life so that he can be more and more effective for you over there in Northern Ireland. Lord, we thank you. We pray that your hand will be upon him, upon his family, and you will continue to um, strengthen him and strengthen his hand for your glory. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for all our brethren here. Lord, they've given up time to come and share with one another to pray. Lord, we thank you. We just ask, oh God, that you, this divine investment you are making in our lives, it will bring forth fruit, the glory of your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. 
In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen. Thank you, my dear brethren. It's really nice to, to have us shared like this together. Please, there's lunch. Paul, sorry. You join us. <laughs> you, you join us in lunch in the spirit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Virtual lunch. <laughs> Come over, I'll take you for a curry. Yes, one of these days we'll have you in person by God's grace. <laughs> Amen. We we'll look Amen. forward to that. Yeah, thank <laughs> you very much, Paul. God bless you. Yes. Yes. God bless. So please, there's lunch.